Hey guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Tamar Meisels and today we're going to talk about Jewish enlightenment. We're going to start with what is the enlightenment, the Jewish enlightenment. I'm going to mention Moses Mendelssohn, Moshe Mendelssohn, a very important figure. And lastly, we're going to talk about the history of the Jewish reform movement. If you understand this topic of Jewish history, you will understand so much about how Judaism is till today. What is enlightenment? During this time, the world moved towards a world of humanism, towards secularism, and especially rationalism. That's why this is also called the Age of Reason. We have the Middle Ages, also known as the Dark Ages, which were dominated by God and the Church. And in the Renaissance and in the Enlightenment, the world is moving towards focusing on man. They begin to value humans and individuals, and that's why they're deserving of civil rights. And the Jews fall into this category of civil rights. So now let's get into the Jewish enlightenment. What does this mean? So Jews up till this point in Europe, were not exactly slaves, but we are sub-citizens. We're marginalized economically, and physically, and we're not allowed into a lot of trades. Interestingly enough, in terms of education, Jews, uh, Jewish boys learned from a very young age to read and to write. They were very, very well uh, literate, even when this wasn't the case in for the rest of the world. So slowly they became emancipated and we were given more and more rights. It started in Western Europe and Napoleon uh, brought this a lot into Eastern Europe as he was uh, conquering. And by the end of the 19th century, Jews are no longer non-citizens. This sounds great. I mean, Jews are accepted into society. Finally, we're able to uh, be accepted and integrated into society. The problem is, is that being Jewish still is an obstacle to being accepted, to being fully accepted. And a lot of Jews felt that in order to be accepted, they had to either uh, minimize their level of Judaism or actually get rid of Judaism entirely. And many did abandon Judaism. It's estimated that about 250,000 Jews assimilated uh, into Christianity in the 19th century. We're talking about many, many Jews who are ridding themselves of their Judaism. And even though the world is becoming more and more secular, they converted to Christianity. And you might ask why? And in that generation, converting to Christianity would be like speaking English today. A man felt he had to become a Christian in the 19th century in the same way he felt he had to learn English in the 20th. It applied to countless non-white natives as well as Jews. A very famous example of this is Jewish writer Henrich Heine, who assimilated into Christianity and at the time, even though Jews were given more and more civil rights, they were still not allowed to become professors in university, which is, was his ambition at the time. So he converted to Christianity. He says, the baptism certificate is the ticket of admission into European society. So we can't talk about Jewish enlightenment without mentioning Moses Moshe Mendelssohn. This is someone who was very much adamant about keeping his Judaism at the same time with participating fully in the European society. And if you tell someone Jewish enlightenment, the first name that will come to mind is Moses Mendelssohn. He was one of the first Jews to really win himself a spot in the non-Jewish world. He had a very broad secular education. By 1763, he was one of the most noted and well-known scholars in Germany. He was so brilliant, in fact, that once they had a competition, some philosophical competition, and he won the first spot in this competition, number two was Immanuel Kant. So this is just to show you what a brilliant uh, man he was and very well known at the time, even though today none of his works are really that famous in the whole philosophy world. At the time, he was very, very well known. So while he's accepted to all these German circles, he's still very much an observant Jew, and he made it his mission to help Jews uh, get civil rights. Uh, one thing he did was he translated the Bible into German, 
And part of the reason he did this was he wanted the Jews to learn German. He wanted to help them become a part of society and he fought for civil rights. Most Orthodox Jews don't really view him in such a great light. And this could be for a few reasons. First of all, perhaps he was a bit naive thinking because he was able to be accepted to German circles and still remain Jewish and a proud Jew. He thought that others would be able to do the same and others that did the same in the following two decades um, mostly assimilated and were not able to remain Jewish. So um, this was a failure. In fact, his children and grandchildren uh, all assimilated. He doesn't have, he did not have any live Jewish descendants. Another criticism is that the Torah is subjected to human reasoning and we kind of perform only to the extent that we understand and we can reason. And that's why in the eyes of many, he's viewed as kind of like the grandfather of reform movement, which we're about to talk about. I did see one opinion that he was 100% kosher um, just that he, it was a little bit too early and he did this before there was any infrastructure to accommodate this. And that's why when Jews tried to follow suit in his way, they quickly assimilated. Two generations later, when Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch talks about the Torah in a more reasoning light and about uh, learning secular education, he's able to form schools that combine both um, world uh, sciences and everything that secular education has to offer together with Torah learning. This infrastructure enabled people to be a Jew in the modern world in a way that is able to persist and Moses Mendelssohn was just a bit too early for this. So this is the story of Moses Mendelssohn. So let's talk about the Jewish reform movement. So while we see this assimilation and conversion to Christianity, there is an attempt to try to remain Jewish or have some sort of connection to Judaism while remaining a fully integrated part of the society. And one attempt is in the early 1800s, the Jewish reform movement. It started in Germany. Some parts of traditional Judaism's lifestyle and nationalism uh, was seen by them as a barrier to be accepted into society, they kind of began on slowly taking things off. Like we keep the Sabbath, we keep the Shabbat, and most of society keeps Sunday as their day of rest. So let's change this day to Sunday. Things like that. We try to make changes and to be more and more like our fellow Christians. Another example of this could be we see our Christians use music and orchestras in their churches. Let's try to combine this in our prayers, in our synagogues, and let's try to be more like them. The first reform synagogue is in 1818 in Hamburg, and it basically imitated a Protestant German service. It played orchestra music. It was held in German. Any parts that mention the land of Israel or anything that had to do with, with Jewish Israeli nationalism was removed and it was 100% loyalty to the German nation. They removed any mention of Jerusalem. They removed any mention of the Messiah and returning to Israel. What's interesting is that they coined the term Orthodox at the time, which they kind of wanted to mean it as a little bit of an insult, like you're Orthodox and you're uh, very stern in your ways and you're not adapting, you're not reforming. And I think today it's kind of like a compliment. Like when I tell people I'm an Orthodox Jew, I'm, I'm proud saying that. So um, this reform attempt in Germany quickly became also a means to assimilate, even though initially they were trying to keep a connection to their Judaism. Within a generation or two, they too um, assimilated into Christianity and it was not successful in the attempt to remain Jewish in any way. Um, later, the reform movement was somewhat successful in different places, such as the United States. Uh, maybe we'll talk about that in future videos. So hope you enjoyed this interesting part of history. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. 
Bye, see you next time. So we have fought not to become assimilated. And where that line is drawn between acculturation and assimilation is a shifting line depending upon countries, nations, civilizations, times, generations. There's no hard and fast rule. You know, intermarriage in the Jewish world uh, always was uh, relatively insignificant, not so much because of the uh, Jewish part, but because of the non-Jewish part. A non-Jew didn't want to marry a Jew. It was a stigma if you had Jews in your family. So uh, if the non-Jews will have us, so then it's a matter of personal decision. It's not a question anymore that they won't have you. And therefore the road to assimilation and to intermarriage is wide open. And unless one has convictions, unless one understands why one is Jewish. I have heard from many Holocaust survivors that in the camps, uh, they said there were Jews that had faith and they had some understanding of what they were doing there, how they got there. But he said there were people that were completely assimilated, people that were, had no connection to Judaism whatsoever and they never understood what they were doing there. So their tragedy was doubled.